This is Tommy's Outdoors 134. Folks, we all know how important the oceans are for the planet, for the health of the planet, and how important they are for shaping the climate uh, on the planet. And today is the episode where we are going to talk about exactly that. Uh, our guest is Dr. Adam Meller, who is a principal scientific officer at Agri-Food and Bioscience Institute. We call them AFPI. And Adam is also science lead uh, the Compass Project. And those of you who are regular listeners know that I had those uh, series of episodes dedicated to those uh, lovely cross-border projects financed by Interreg VA. And we thought we had a project MARPAM, which is uh, about all about MPAs. That's a, that was a big one. Just recently, we finished the series of podcasts about the CAN project, which is about the bogs in the wetlands and freshwater lakes, etc. Earlier, uh, two years ago, I guess, we, we talked about Sea Monitor Project. And so today, um, this is the first episode of another series dedicated to Compass Project. So we are going back into talking about the oceans. So we start our conversation with a brief introduction to uh, Compass Project and what it is and what it's aiming to achieve. And then we diving deep into oceanography and what it is. Um, we talk about those oceanic buoys and uh, how, you know, what goes into maintenance of those buoys and how you essentially running a network of those buoys. And then we talk about some interesting insights and data that was uh, that scientists from Compass Project extracted from the network of those boys. And among others, we talk about extreme ocean climate events. We talk about ocean heat waves. Uh, so yeah, it uh, turns out that there are also heat waves at the ocean, not only on the land. And uh, we, we spend some time discussing them and what that means for the climate of the planet. So folks, uh, if you're interested in this uh, type of uh, topics, you should definitely subscribe to Tommy's Outdoors newsletter. Uh, the link is in the description of the show, or you just can go to newsletter.tommysoutdoors.com, subscribe to the newsletter. Uh, you should expect to get that newsletter roughly around the time when the new podcast episode comes out. Um, so it is like twice, maybe three times a month. So I'm not going to be spamming your email, um, but you will get a, a firsthand um, notification about the new stuff coming out of Tommy's Outdoors. And also you can always reply to that email and that email gets directly to my inbox and I reply to every single one of those. So if you have a feedback, questions, suggestions, what you wanna hear in the podcast in a few other future episodes, then uh, that's the best way to contact me. All right, folks, um, that's it for this introduction. And now uh, Ocean Science with Adam Meller. Adam, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you, finally. Yes, brilliant. Thanks very much for inviting us. It's um, it's been a while coming, but glad we can finally get to have this chat. And it was um, it was good to meet you at the meeting. Um, crikey, it's a couple of months back now, isn't it? But, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's good. To be People who don't know, we were, we were on the on the closure event of uh, Marpam, which uh, I'm sure the uh, listeners are very familiar with. And now the another one, Compass, like a like a sister project. Would it be fair to say that it's a sister project? Yeah, um, absolutely. They are sister projects. And if I was um, if I was being really a, a sort of aggressive and so on, I mean, Compass came first, and we um, we launched the pair of projects from from within the institute. The proposals way back 2015, we started developing the concepts of of both projects, and um, just by virtue of the way um, the logistics and um, and the funding streams worked out. Compass launched, um, crikey, a few months ahead anyway of, of MARPAM, but they're very much sister projects designed to to meet the needs of um, this this call through through the Interreg funding stream. And of course, we mustn't forget there was a third project, Sea Monitor, that was funded a little later on through that call as well. So um, there's a little there's a little triplet of of really exciting and ambitious uh, projects going on. And, uh, and listeners and viewers should be familiar with uh, Sea Monitor as well, because we also, so so Compass started as the first, but it's last to come to Tommy's Outdoors. I don't know how that could happen. But anyway, 
<laughs> Glad to have you here today. Glad to be here. And um, as we say, you know, it's um, save the best till last, Tommy. Ah, there you go. There you go. <laughs> Listen, you're, you're touching on a very interesting thing. Uh, and this is something I, I want to inquire. So just to, you know, lay things out, COMPASS stands for Collaborative Oceanog- Oceanography and Monitoring for Protected Areas and Species, like two S in species. So it's COMPASS. Um, And before we dive into like the details of Compass project, tell me like why, why, like how does that work that we need like three projects that are uh, essentially like in the same area? How did that work? Why we couldn't have like a one big project and why there are three projects? Like, so I'm interested in the mechanics of this. Yes. So when, when the call was launched, um, by SEUPB, the organization who managed this funding stream, they consult with the, um, the the sort of lead policy bodies. You know, in Northern Ireland, it's DARA, and it's another department in the south, um, and another one again over in Scotland. And they sort of discuss and agree the range of priorities that they have, you know, things that they would really like to achieve with, with environmental work. Um, that then has to roll out into deliverables effectively, sort of discrete deliverables and what they want to actually achieve that can be, I suppose, measured and assessed, you know, have they met some goals? So they publish a list of goals and um, how they want to do that. And in Interreg, there was a couple of specific goals that very much appealed to the area that I work in. Um, and we discuss with our policy leads and we started to form sort of networking groups amongst the other um, institutes around the region to develop, I suppose, what what then can become quite a coherently themed project. Because if you try and do everything in one project, you can spread yourselves too thin. And there's areas where sort of within my professional network and people that we reached out to that we felt were within our our, our our zone of comfort and, and expertise, which was bringing in the oceanography, bringing in some of the um, the fish tracking and the marine mammal acoustics and some of these things, and actually tying those together into a coherent project. So I never, I never took it upon myself to extend this project into actually developing management plans, which, for example, was an area that the MARPAM project. Um, really got stuck into quite holistically. Um, and, and, and equally, we sort of touched in areas um, with a, a fairly balanced approach to, to some of the issues like um, tracking migratory fish and so on, which again, projects like Sea Monitor really put an, an enhanced focus on. So it was really a question of getting a balanced theme or a balanced project that we felt we could manage and was scalable. Um, and that reduces some of the risks as well in terms of dependencies on on others or other work packages. So it was really just to try and get the flavor and the theme and the expertise that we, we could assemble to deliver that. So how long was it for the Compass project? We'd have developed it probably from around 2015 concept notes were coming together. Um, and then we worked, you know, between Scotland, um, Southern Ireland and Northern Ireland, we, we got a lot of the, the right people together and the right institutes and built the, um, the, the projects. Of course, everybody's interested. They, they're championing their specific areas of expertise. So we have these sort of trade-offs and balances, both budget as well as time and effort of, of how we can, how we can balance these different, um, these different areas. And, you get to a stage where the proposal has gone into a, it went into a you know a competitive funding environment, so your proposal is assessed against others, and um, and, and evaluated by an independent panel. And um, we were very fortunate to come up, you know, um, come up trumps with that, and they liked the project. There were some tweaks that they wanted to do, but by the time a lot of the funding uncertainties and government sign-offs had had really come into place. Um, it was sometime probably July 2017, I think, um, and we'd already started the project effectively at risk by that stage because you know all of the partners are very committed. They know um, you know if you don't start now, you're going to miss this year's run of fish, or you know there's various biological things that we can't hold on to. So um, the project, in a very limited fashion, got underway and started to mobilise. 
and um, ran for a total of about five years. So we're just coming to the closing stages now, um, just reporting, um, writing papers and, and transferring the knowledge and findings to to the policy leads. And of course, um, open as well, trying to make those as open and discoverable as possible. Recording podcasts. Recording podcasts, absolutely. There's... Um, <laughs> There's there's a whole it's been it's been a real learning. Um, I before I did this project I had never tweeted. Um, um, oh wow! So I'm a complete social media starter, and I probably still am on that front. And indeed, this is my my first podcast. So um, right. let's, let's hope Very it gets good. listened to. So Adam, listen, you're you're touching on many things that I that I w would like to drill down a little bit further. But before we go there. Uh, so can you lay it out for us exactly what is Compass? Like, so what is that specific area that Compass works on? And then probably within the project itself, you also have these work packages. I, you know, out of these all the episodes, I know that the work package is like an interreg kind of like a terminology. So can you tell us like in general, what is Compass aiming to achieve as a project as a whole, and then all those work packages? And, and I can also just add it here, uh, folks, that we, as usual in those cases, will have more episodes about uh, dedicated, you know, specific work packages in Compass. So this one is just the first one. Yeah, so um, I'll try and give you the broadest overview that I can. But the project um, in itself, I suppose, is designed to support um, marine protected areas and species and support the management of those protected areas and species. So across across this region, which is, um, I suppose, a, a geopolitically defined concept of um, the border counties of, of Ireland and uh, Northern Ireland and that Western belt of Scotland, they're deemed, you know, there's opportunity to, to, to really enhance our, our environmental protection by or enhance you know improve the environment actually not just the management and protection but to enhance the environment um, and to get that together that sort of geopolitical context covers where your activity should be focused um, because this is the region that they want to see um, benefiting from the investment in, in effect so using that sort of funding stream they, they, they gave us a number of deliverables that they wanted to achieve and at a very high level, that's about supporting the management of, of marine protected areas. Now, marine protected areas are, of course, a concept that, um, like anything, you know, they have their pros and cons and there are, there are wins and then there are things that aren't necessarily perfect about protecting marine areas. But the objective is, is to try and, as well as areas, species which, you know, may not um, respect geographical boundaries, a bit like people, you know, they migrate left, right and centre. So it's getting a better understanding of how we can manage, whether it's specific areas, um, which are designated, these are sort of policy designated features, it could be for for um, you know, deep sea corals or for porpoise or for a certain type of shellfish. Um, but also then finding out more about the species that move about because designating an area for, um, you know, for a species, uh, say a whale that's going to get harpooned somewhere else as soon as it swims outside isn't a particularly effective management measure. So the aim of the project um, was to really start to develop a baseline of environmental information um, to support and build on some of the work that already goes on and there's some brilliant work going on you know across those three jurisdictions that has um, sometimes you know the funding can be a little uncertain and we're, we're always trying to, to consolidate and keep these things going so it supported existing stuff and more importantly enhanced it to help us meet those management needs so better information about the regional climate better information about um Areas where we've got complete knowledge gaps, you know, the the occurrence of a lot of marine mammals. The, there was there was huge gaps there where the migratory fish swim, um, and then developing tools that help us explore those and also help others, you know, by by providing those tools to explore what the problem is with um, let's let's take salmon for example, or or you know you can use any number of examples there to to really illustrate the impact of the activity. So the project itself dealt with um, 
we called it collaborative oceanography and monitoring. Um, we wanted to look really at that climate and that platform, you know, so oceanography is, 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 is understanding our ocean climate, both above as well as um, probably more key below the water. And putting that in the context of we took some specific species um, and things that we needed to learn. And the deliverable was to establish a network of boys um, was the specific language that was used to, to support the management of marine species. So that network of boys and um, a number of models, so computational models, were to help us or to help the, the government administrations better manage those protected areas and species. You mentioned oceanography, and that was one of the things that I was going to ask you, because oceanography is a term that people use, and but I'm not sure if they are, you know, really understand what that is. And you already gave like a definition that I never heard about, which is like a climate of the, of the ocean. So can you kind of explain to people what is oceanography? Now you just hit me with probably one of the most challenging questions about how do I describe my my own discipline. There's um, <laughs> this is the moment where you see me going off screen and googling. Um, so Wiki Wikipedia, I'm sure, or something like this, will give you some very well defined and discrete um, definitions. But it's quite a broad discipline in many ways. There's a lot of people. Classic oceanographers have a strong basics basis in physics. And, you know, this sort of brings into line our physical oceanography. So where water is flowing, what temperature it might be, how big waves are, how it interacts with the climate and so on. These are all very much what we call the physical oceanography uh, features. So a whole uh, meteorological forecasting system, you know, across the world relies on both uh, meteorologists and oceanographers because those are the two big global systems that interact to give us our climate, be that your atmospheric climate, which is influenced by the ocean, or your oceanic climate, which of course is influenced, you know, very precisely by, by the atmosphere and what's going on there. They both drive each other in different cycles. Then getting more into sort of maybe the area that I work in, we step into biological oceanography. And um, quite often there's there's a lot of gray areas here. There's areas that are, are fairly new and we talk about microbiology and understanding um, bacterial cycles and biogeochemistry within the ocean, another sort of sub-discipline. But largely we're taking on the biological aspects of oceanography. So whether they're bacteria, um, there's a huge focus and concern over plankton at the moment. And this is both phytoplankton, which are our primary produces, our, our grass of the ocean, to give it a sort of agricultural context. Um, or maybe we should use wildflower meadow because of the diversity. That's probably a better, a better sort of parallel. Um, but, but, you know, we're looking at those plankton things and that can expand, you know, I think taking it into the realms of fisheries and marine mammals is perhaps a little bit um, adventurous with, with defining or constraining a term. But really, it's looking about those biological aspects of, of ocean climate, how they interact with, with ourselves, with other species, with fisheries, um, all of those concerns. Yeah, I remember on the on the on the closing event there was a talk uh, by a gentleman who said like, you know, I'm not a biologist, I'm not like I'm the, I'm a physicist, and I'm, I'm a physicist like a, uh, a liquid physics, and, and and was talking about the analysis of how the different layers in the ocean flows and how there have there's a friction between them and all that. It was like, wow, that's very interesting because it's like a truly multidisciplinary um engagement where you have like a like a physicist and, and chemists and i didn't even know there's like something like a ocean chemists or you know yeah i mean crikey biogeochemists you know they all have Bio. their separate sub disciplines it's um it's really diverse but i think you know that's one of the things that these sort of partnership projects you know where you go to other be they universities institutes or government bodies and sometimes it's, you know, it's within a network of people you know and, and trust and, you know, importantly get on with, but um, also meeting people from different disciplines, you know, and starting to work with them 
as um, it's been brilliant. It's just been fascinating. And I can remember, I remember at the start of the project, I said, I'd quite like to be a salmon scientist for the next few years because they've got some really interesting stuff going on. And then, you know, I met the guy who was leading the, the data management work package, who was a brilliant communicator. Um, and, and all of a sudden, I got interested in, you know, this almost like a philosophy of data management and how we can share as well as the technical thing. But, but you know, the, you meet these people and, and when they're really, you know, switched on people, they can make something that you'd perceive as a bit dry be really interesting. So, um, yeah, that's been great fun. Yeah, I, I can imagine. I can imagine. And you, you're in this in this project. You are lead scientist or science leader. That's uh, so. What is your what is your role? What does lead scientist does on the on the project that is so impossibly wide and and diverse in terms of different? You are you are like salmon scientist, salmon scientist, and uh, chemist and physics and <laughs> everything. Yeah, I mean, science lead sounds incredibly grandiose because. Um, by no means, even in my own field, am I the expert on 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 everything in there. You know, and I sort of work in the oceanographic sector, um, and to suggest that I could be a, a lead scientist in um, disciplines like modelling and and um, salmon science or marine mammals, you know, I could almost quietly hear the work package leads chuckling. You know, if if um, <laughs> if that was the if that was the thing. But I think you're going to get to speak to some of them, aren't you? And um, you can really delve into their areas. Um, so the lead science, the lead scientist, or the science lead, might be might be quite a good way of terming it. Was when we pulled the proposal together. I suppose it was having an oversight of what the 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 call, the investment wanted to achieve. Um, and my role then was very much to liaise with the government bodies and the funding agency to really start to establish where their priorities and needs were and how to balance that, and then to to implement that within. Um, a network, indeed, sort of create a network as well to a certain extent of the right experts you need to pull all of that together. Because um, across the project, there's been, um, I think it was five uh, individual work packages. Um, and for each of those, you then need to actually find somebody who's capable of, of, of leading and has that um, not just the science knowledge, but but the leadership ability and um, and and the patience and energy to actually see it through. Because there's a lot happened over the lifetime of the projects, and um, these people who've led the individual science packages have have had quite a journey um, and have just done sort of an absolutely brilliant job of actually getting it through now to where we're getting to delivery and legacy. And um, rather than dealing with the minutiae of, you know, these trifling issues like Brexit and COVID and things like that, we're actually focusing back on on what they've achieved. So it's it's good. So it sounds like you, you are the one to absorb the impact of the... Um, yeah, a, a lot of it is quite a tiring. Um, it's quite a tiring role, sounding very self-pitying. Um, you want to indulge sometimes in, as a scientist, in um, you know some of the minutiae, and I got very frustrated not being able to to work closely with some of the science leads or their teams because um, because I was so busy, sort of more in a, a coordinating and oversight role. So you can see bits of science going on that you'd love to learn about or really clever people that you'd like to sit next to, you know, and hope that some of their cleverness rubs off on you or something like that. And it was like, um, yeah, that can be really frustrating. But then on the other side, you know, it's lovely and, and very rewarding actually getting the right people connected and seeing that the outputs that they're coming out with. So um, it's um, swings and roundabouts, you know, it's um, no, 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 no doubt. And, and you're right. That's a, you know, you always try to find a, like a, satisfying elements on, on your on your job especially when you're essentially enabling these other people um adam i want to ask you about this network of the of the oceanographic boys um this is this, this can you explain to us like how that boy looks like what is this is like pretty sophisticated piece of hardware so i'd like to know more about you know this boy as a device and then how you deploy them you know what maintenance is going on and all those like a more like a technical 
things yeah. that are going on around it. Yeah, so sort of oceanographic buoys are probably the mainstay of, of um, what we call in situ um, oceanographic monitoring. And they can be tiny, um, but typically, you know, classically, they're really big, really heavy, expensive things. So, you know, recently we've been developing um, what would quite legitimately um, um, class as an oceanographic buoy, and, and we called it sort of in a familiar name, a little minion buoy. It's based on a little yellow float about yay big, and we've put some quite small and low-cost um, novel technology in it. And it's sitting outside just off the coast of Northern Ireland, um, going beep and sending us back really, really good data on this one's on um, – its temperature and dissolved oxygen in a certain water body. So, you know, that is an oceanographic buoy. It's a small floaty thing with with some, some technology in it that allows you to observe um, something of interest, something that you, you, you determine is going to be important to that location. When we, when we scale those up, when we, we took the Compass project, we know that in this this region between between Ireland, Scotland, and Northern Ireland, we've got um, some of Europe's longest continuous data sets. Um, and what we wanted to do was was support them. You know, if there was threat to ongoing funding, Compass was a great opportunity and vehicle to be able to support this. Um, we wanted to enhance them. So they might have been measuring, for example, temperature since the, the 70s or 80s. Um, but since then, we've developed a much bigger understanding of issues like, like climate change, ocean acidification, and so on. So we wanted to develop them that we could bring in um, new parameters that, that have a policy drive that mean, you know, we need to monitor them and understand them. As well as you know, it's it's really the more recent technology that brings that into um, an effective monitoring tool. So some of these things can be really expensive. You know, the operational expenditure to to manage them can be can be a lot of money. So having a time bound project allows us to evaluate that, and it can go then to the the government funding agencies. Can you afford to maintain or sustain that, or do you need something different? So. Um, we had a number of established moorings, and um, for my part, in 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 um, um, my Northern Irish sort of hat on, although the boy sits just inside Irish waters, it's um, it's a mooring in the the Western Irish Sea that we we give the the name 38A, which is a very dry station monitoring. But we'll come up with a grand title for it. It's our Western Irish Sea Observatory. Um, and it really is. It's a fantastic thing that some of my predecessors had the foresight to establish. And it's been running for um, um, not quite 30 years, but just sort of the high 20s. And it's measuring the, the ocean climate and some of the biological aspects in the Western Irish Sea and has this amazing time series of, of near continuous observations. So that allows us potentially to detect these slow creeping, creeping trends of, um, you know, that you might associate with climate change. But it also allows us, because it's in situ and always going beep at quite high frequency, we can detect little blips or perturbations in the pattern, which at that site's becoming um, increasingly interesting. Um, then within the swathe of things, there's a mooring that was more of a virtual mooring, but they sometimes had instrumentation at it, sometimes didn't, on the west coast of Scotland near um, the, the Scottish Association for Marine Science, one of our partners. And this station was always sampled. And again, it has a great time series and a great understanding of what's happened there. So there we were able to establish um, a new mooring that allowed us to test and develop some of the sensors and their application, as well as a permanent observation piece at the location. The Tyree mooring um, is, I think it is officially Europe's longest continuous marine time series. And that's a, a data buoy that sits in the Tyree passage off the west coast. Uh, has a lot of provenance, but has also been very much at risk um, because the funding streams haven't been um, haven't been theirs. There's been you know shrinkage across the sector to maintain it. So that was a great opportunity to to work on on the projects that and and to sort of embrace those and bring those time series in and and support them. 
And then up on the coast further up, we've got right at the northern boundary of our area is an area that had um, quite an old and failing system, um, which which really was was in need of some investment. And Marine Scotland joined us to basically said, we can invest here, we can bring in these, these parameters, the ocean climate, the ocean acidification parameters, and it will benefit the region as well as their um, monitoring site. Um, and again, that's a site that has this massive investment by the, the, the Scottish Government and Marine Science Scotland in terms of understanding a whole variety of, of parameters there. And then if we come full circle back around the coast, we get back to probably what is physically one of the biggest buoys um, of our uh, network within Compass. And that was one that the Marine Institute uh, built themselves and established a location called Mace Head. So the Marine Institute have a, a position where like the rest of us, they've used commercially sourced buoys or, or hybrids where we integrate commercial systems together. And the Marine Institute have a, um, an interesting position of um, also maintaining the Irish meteorological buoy network. Um, we'd already mentioned those interactions between our meteorology and our ocean climate. So they were, they'd just sort of developed their concept of a new infrastructure, a new buoy infrastructure. They're talking about power, um, oodles and oodles of solar panels, um, the processing power and data logging capacity on site, and the physical uh, presence to be able to understand um, the worst that the, the, the Northeast Atlantic can throw, you know, at that coast. So Compass was a really useful vehicle for them to build out and actually trial their new buoy architecture with all of the relevant sensors at Mace Head. And then more importantly, also to share um, that technology. It's all very much open. Um, and it was the ability to be able to share with the other partners and say, if you want to copy this or, you know, we can help you build that. That was very much the rationale, one of, of mutual support and um, um, collaboration on that front. So, yeah, it was, it, was, it was really different. You know, when you get to that scale of things, these boys are massive. Um, I've got something similar just parked just outside my office here, you know, in Belfast. And... Um, um, I need a bigger forklift truck to move it. You know, I mean, um, we had to hire a crane in just to move it about. And luckily our ship, you know, has, has the handling power to move it. But these are really big um, units. They can weigh, as I said, anything from a few kilograms up to um, several tons, three or four tons. They have their own power infrastructure, their own data infrastructure, and then all of the scientific instrumentation on them. So, um, yeah, they can be they can be quite an undertaking. Quite a lot to maintain. And, and do you need to go and like a service them from time to time? I presume. And how lot? So how often someone needs to like physically show up where the boy is and inspect it? And and because I presume like most of the time you just you just get a telemetry yeah. telemetry data from it. Yeah. And so I I just have to mention right now that people who can go to Compass website Compass Dash Ocean Science EU, and then there is a menu option Compass Data Portal. And there's all that data from these boys in there, and like you know, like a data data geeks can like geek out all they want on the ocean temperature and all that on the compass data portal. It's it's quite awesome. I, I went in there and was clicking around and looking at these data series. But anyway, going back to the question, like you, you know, like how how often you need to come, you know, go to that boy and inspect it and like physically. Yeah, so there. there's a number of parameters that sort of drive that, you know, and obviously first and foremost is how well have you built your data boy and how often does it break down? Um, it's a really, really tough environment, you know, trying to maintain um, electronic hard hardware in salt water that can get absolutely hammered um, by, you know, by waves and so on, as well as by other boats that, you know, might well collide or, you know, gear that could interact with them. It happens. I mean, they're well marked, you know, they're charted, they have warnings on them. But, you know, occasionally you could have an interaction there, you know, and um, that's obviously very frustrating. And Interaction, probably... you called it interaction. So the, so the ship just rams into your very expensive boy. <laughs> it's, it's, it's difficult to know because the, the very nature of the beast is you're not there to see exactly what happens. 
Um, so there can sometimes be a bit of forensic um, um, reconstruction because you typically have to find your buoy or pieces of it, sometimes off the, the bottom of the sea. Um, sometimes, you know, if you're lucky, um, a, a fishing boat or another vessel will have picked it up and, you know, this is where the goodwill and an interaction with the maritime community is is absolutely, you know, precious because people will tell us they'll report it, that it's moving, or they'll even collect it, you know, and um, you maybe have to go to a port and recover it from the back of their boat. Um, but yeah, so that's obviously the first thing that, that means you've got to rush out and that's a difficult one to manage because you've got to have ships handling gear, crew that can actually deal with that. Um, in terms of routine sort of operational uh, maintenance, then um, it comes down to a certain amount of um, what are the sensors that you've got on board um, and what are your requirements for it? Because from the moment you put a scientific instrument in the water, um, its quality of data is being challenged. Um, as soon as you put something in the water, something will want to grow on that sensor or crawl across it or something like this. So um, I wouldn't like to even estimate the number of times, you know, we've been measuring um, a barnacle's backside instead of, you know, water <laughs> quality because one has grown right on the sensor. But um, again, over the last, you know, decade or more, we've, we've worked with a lot of providers, things, very simple things like brushes have become commonplace and ubiquitous for sensors. So a little motor and an actuator that, you know, wipes your sensor face and things like this. And those are a game changer. They really um, improve your sensor quality, um, you know, no end. And you can reduce the amount of time, how often you have to go out. So if I left just a sensor out in the sea, if I left it somewhere in the near shore, I'd probably have to be out at it after a week to give it a wipe and a clean up. Um, if I leave one that's properly anti-fouled, you know, has maybe some some copper tape around the outside, a brush that wipes the sensor surface, and I leave that out in the open ocean, you know, not close into the coast, it can survive for months, you know, and still have really good data quality. So the location is very important. You know, if there's a lot of a, a heavy fouling environment, you know, lots of things that are going to grow on it. Um, and then how you treat that sensor and put it out there. Obviously, temperature sensors are brilliant. You know, they're a lot more robust and because um, they're not optical surfaces, they, um, they're they not so heavily influenced. But um, so there's a lot of variables there. And um, you get to the stage of saying there's some things that aren't necessarily worth supporting because they require too much maintenance to keep going, you know, and a brush is very good for wiping away um, things that will grow on a surface, but then things grow on top of your brush and dangle over your measurement surface. <laughs> and you can't have a brush for a brush. You know, you just, you couldn't afford it. So, um, yeah. So the short answer, I've really wibbled on, is anything between a couple of weeks and a few months, I think, a very is a very reasonable bracket of how often you need to go out there. And that I presume that 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 this is like a massive amount of money also required, like in terms of like you said that something happened with that boy and you need to get the ship and you get there, and so is was that all financed uh, from the budget of Compass? And once Compass is finished, it's gone, and those boys will deteriorate, and nobody will be wiping them anymore. Or what 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 are the plans for the for the future? You know, once the once the project is is completed, who's, who's yeah. going to take care of that? I think having a big um, a big sort of bit of kit that was going to sit redundant out of the project after the project was really core to our design. So we didn't want to overinvest in buying. You know, say, look, we've got a, a a bag of EU funding here. We can buy three or five new data boys, run them for a few years, and then there'd be an embarrassing silence. You know, so that was. Um, the design of the project was to not end up in that position. So, for example, the moorings that we have adopted, um, Tyree Passage 38A, in, in my case for AFB, has been sort of given over to the project, means that those boys have got a legacy. So any investment in them is underpinned by those organizations' core activities. So 
um, we don't have a, a time frame on how long we'll maintain our mooring in the Western Irish Sea. And I'm sure the same is true for uh, Marine Scotland's up in, in Loch U and, and the Tyree Passage. Funding, you know, we're always sort of having to apply for new cycles of funding to keep these. But the whole concept of the project was to invest in some sustainable um, areas of projects. There'll always be some risk. But what we wanted to do was to make sure that what we're learning at those sites is enhanced but it's also likely to continue. And that was that was probably one of the most holistic um, philosophies we had about bringing this together. Um, but it wasn't to the exclusion of, of enabling new sites where they were needed. So the Mace Head site off the west coast of Ireland that the Marine Institute manage is a brand new site. It's co-located with the Mace Head Atmospheric Observatory Station. So again, we're, we're, we're seeing this coupling between um, um, ocean and atmosphere, you know, both in science as well as in our operations. And there isn't um, necessarily secured funding for that stream, but the drive and the will of the team at the Marine Institute are the ones that are now looking to continue that legacy and really keep it going. So, yeah, it was a really important philosophy, not to put it bluntly, not to have a flash in the pan. Mm. Yeah, uh, that's that's always good to hear, and because this is this is like we said it many times on the podcast that this is m most important thing. So the the legacy of those projects kind of continue. Adam, if you would like to pick one, you know, like a most surprising or most groundbreaking or something that stand out to you the most, what you found or what you discovered during the duration of the project, what would it be? There's like <gasps> moments. There is. It's 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 really difficult to think um, of a single specific, you know, a superlative of what was a real surprise. Um, there's been some really, really, I suppose, some of the the oceanographic elements to me um, may not have been too much of a surprise because you know I'm I'm much more familiar with that field, um, but just. One of those topical things that occurred, it was 2021, was um, our marine chemist here within AFB, Billy Hunter, was analysing some of the temperature data. And then along with um, one of our fisheries scientists, Stephen Beggs, they, they sort of put together a, a climatology of the Western Irish Sea at the point where we have this, this mooring, this observatory. Um, 2021, then, we're talking, you know, about um, ocean climate and increasing temperatures, you know, is, is something everyone's familiar with. We're not really seeing that signal yet in the Western Irish Sea. And you sort of, you know, you, you sort of almost feel a bit disappointed because you don't have one of these classic trends. But in this climatology, they were noting this real blip in July 2021 and this heat wave and we're starting to sort of really sort of notice and um, the whole scientific community this is, is to look at the, um, the importance of extreme events. And I think this year, you know, that the media has been plastered in 2022 with record heat waves, you know, on land in Europe, in the UK, even in Ireland. And um, these sort of events we were seeing last year in the marine and those are not just obviously the solar, the wind and the wave climate, you know, really built to that. But through the compass um, sort of, what's the best say, um, project, we could quickly access data from the Scottish and the Irish counterparts. And you could see that it wasn't just something that was local there in the Western Irish Sea. You know, it's a true marine heat wave um, occurring across the region, which is an extreme event. Consequences of yet, we've still, I suppose, to fully understand, but we know, as with all these things, there are consequences. So we're, we're putting together um, a paper on that at the moment to really start to further that. Um, so that was a surprise in my own discipline. Um, and then things that were being discovered in the other disciplines, there's a world of surprises because, you know, these are, exp these are areas outside of my sort of field of expertise. So um, at the start of the project, we had the biggest ever um, stranding globally of beaked whales in this region. Um, and, you know, this was quite a major event. Hundreds, I think, from memory were, were stranded. The inference being then there had been a lot more that had, had perished because a lot of them won't have stranded on the beaches or been discovered. 
And um, that was quite something. And what was what was really impressive, and it wasn't a specific compass output, but it involved um, the compass partners using the systems that we were developing within compass. So this was um, um, the teams from um, the Scottish Association for Marine Institute ourselves, the, um, the Marine Institute in the South, put together the oceanographic models along with the marine mammal experts and effectively reversed them. So once they understood when and where these animals had stranded around the coast, uh, they could run the models backwards and understand the probability of where they originated, which was sort of a, an area off the coastal shelf, off the coast of Mayo. Um, and I think it was commented on at the meeting you're at our um, our um, the Compass and Marpam meeting. You know we 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 don't have um, the answer to why that is, but one of the probably most likely scenarios would be in that case military sonar activity going on out there. Um, you might call it a speculation or so on, but um, we have listening stations across the region and. Um, these sonars are something that we do pick up on, you know, so it does happen. Um, we can't, you know, it's not not a question of finger pointing, but it's a question of understanding um, what, are, what are probable causes, I suppose, is the best way to put it. So, yeah, um, there's, there's any number of exciting novel things like that. Um, looking at where um, sea trout, you know, were migrating both north and south. You know, we always think sal salmonid fish. They, they go up the coast and out into the Atlantic as part of their life cycle and then come back. But we were seeing, you know, more local two-way migration um, um, in sea trout along the east coast of Ireland. And then some really, you know, quite amusing anecdotes, which you could put a, a completely artificial political nuance on of, um, you know, fish from the north visiting the Boyne around the 12th of July and um, things like this. Now, I think I think they're fairly sort of agnostic as far as those things are concerned. But that was the important message was these fish don't care about politics or events or things like this. They're traveling to and from across an open border. Um, and that's how we've got to treat them. We can't protect an area or we can't have a policy in one jurisdiction and something different in another um, and it's a really good analog for you know how we should operate socially as well in terms of anything that's isolationist um, you know is is vulnerable you know you've got to look at that bigger thing so um, um, crikey I'm drifting into politics aren't I right we'll leave that no, that's okay. That's that's okay. Uh, listen, I, I I would like to inquire a little bit more about this uh, ocean heat wave. So, what what temperatures are we talking about? Like, how does how does the ocean heat wave look like? So, um, this this is a challenge. I've got to try and describe a graph um, rather than actually show you one. But if you can imagine, you know, over the course of a year, your temperature gets warmer in the summer and cooler in the winter. So, if you're graph looks like starts in January and finishes in December, you'll have this sort of peak of temperature, you know, in the sort of midpoint. Typically around July, August, we're getting the warmest temperatures when the capacity of the water has actually absorbed and taken. So it's not the peak atmospheric temperature, but that's when you get the peak water temperatures. So if you've had the, um, the luck of having instruments in the water, I shouldn't say luck, the foresight or, you know, the privilege of having instruments in the water, measuring things year on year. You can overlay, you know, every year's data on that map and you'll get you'll get a bit of variation. So you'll get, you know, a blurred edge to that line and it'll be a broader band getting warmer in the summer and the winter. And that, if you like, is what we call developing a climatology. It's understanding what the temperature should be around that time of year. And that takes into all of the variation. You know, you've got cold summers, you've got hot summers, you've got hot winters or mild winters, we might want to call them. So understanding all of that variation gives you what we would call the climatology. And then the 2021 data, by the time it got to, well, it's not just July, there was a smaller blip shortly before. But the data for that specific year, when you put it into that graph and those statistical packages, these have to be tested with um, a number of sort of quite robust statistical routines. You can see that graphically that 
that summer peak just in July bursts that bubble, that envelope of the climatology, sticks out right above it and then drops back down later in July. And largely that was down to not just you know, there being a good warm period during July, but it was also down to the um, the fact that we had very still and calm conditions. So it meant mixing was very much less, you know, that water wasn't mixed with cooler water from deep down. And that was one of the big drivers was because it was so still and settled over that month in the summer, it really allowed the heat to build up in the surface. Um, our worry is then is that events like that, whether you can detect a climate trend, a long-term trend or not, events like that will effectively cook or poach, you know, things that are in the water. You'll you'll breach their sort of zone of comfort for what they want to live and exist in. So um, yeah, I hope I hope that sort of describes, but it's it's about understanding how that year was different to every other year and being very clear you know, using statistics that it's not just something you can see or infer with your eyeball. Um, the numbers are saying that's that's unusual. Do you have do you do you have on the on top of top of your head the the maximum water temperature? So those temperatures um, that we recorded on that event were coming up to in July just under twenty degrees in the water. Um, so. This is out in the middle of the Western Irish Sea. Now, just reading off the plot there that I've got on the screens in front of me was our average um, concent concentration, our average temperature for that time of year, sitting around the 15 degrees mark and normally peaking at around 16. But um, on this occasion, it had jumped up well above the the envelope, the statistical envelope of the normal, which might take you up to 16 and 16 and a half degrees, jumped up to near 20 degrees. Um, and that's a smooth data line. So you'll have had small spikes, you know, above that. And that's measured one meter below the surface, I think, is is um, is is that reading. So we've also got corresponding data there. This is the important thing is it's not just understanding what's going on at the surface. So many of these sites we support what we call as a thermistor chain. So other sensors going down, right down through to the sea floor. So we can see then that the penetration of these events, you know, how, how much of the surface, the top 10, 20, 30 meters, um, becomes abnormal and where there's there's changes in that. So understanding in the Western Irish Sea, because it isn't well mixed, it's something that we call seasonally stratified. Every summer, it sort of splits into two layers. You get this warm surface layer and this cooler bottom layer. So understanding that's really important because then we can understand the dynamics and how gradual climate change is going to either enhance or perhaps, you know, reduce that layer of stratification and when the sea separates into two separate water bodies. So those are just some of the things that we draw out from that. But it was um it was quite extreme. I'll I'll um Oh. I'll send you the plot across if you're if you're interested. Yeah, please, please do. Uh, absolutely, uh, I, I I would love to you know put it on the show notes and so people can see it. Um, Adam, so that is really interesting. I have a, a one question that is kind of like not related to the temperature, but something I you mentioned at the top of the show, and I would like to get a little bit more information about. And these are worries about plankton. Uh, I heard about it and read about it, and I'm sure a lot of listeners also heard and listened and, and read about it. Uh, tell us what's going on. Okay, is this? Did you pick up on the the sort of recent media stuff over the last? There was stuff in the last maybe four or five weeks. Some very yeah, prob probably yes. I don't remember exactly, but that was you know yeah, I was yeah. reading. I was reading my doing my uh, share of doom scrolling, and it's like oh now plankton. That's all we needed now. So. Yeah, I um I like that line doom scrolling. There's times where. Yeah, we want to hold our head in our hands when we look at, um, at what we're facing. Um, yes, I saw a headline, it must have been four or five weeks ago maybe, of 90% of the Northeast Atlantic plankton or North Atlantic plankton, can't remember the details. Something um, like that. Has yeah. gone, you know, it's dead. And, um, you know, my first reaction was, don't be silly. <laughs> no, it's not. 
you know, that's not my understanding of it. But there's always something in your head that says um, it's it's based on a certain layer, sort of level of credibility. It's not inconceivable. Um, I very quickly got on the phone and the email to some of the, the real plankton experts. These are people across across the UK from as far afield as as Plymouth in in the south coast of England to um, Sam's and Marine Scotland in the north. And there's a group there um, within the UK and Ireland called the Pelagic Habitats Expert Group. Um, it's a fantastic group of people, and again, really intelligent and luckily really nice people who who I enjoy working with and, and really humour me when I come in with a maybe a slightly um, naive question. These are people whose lives and jobs they live, sleep, and breathe plankton. Um, and I said, "Really? Um, have you guys heard about this? Is there something we <laughs> we need to just get a little bit of a reality check on?" Uh, it very quickly escalated because that sensational headline um, was, um, I have to be careful here, it was probably a combination of um, poor science um, or lack of science as well as um, poor reporting. And I think, you know, I mean, I'll put that out there. Um, it can be rebutted by either the reporting bodies or the, the people who put the work out there. But I think what was really important um, was that it highlighted that there is a problem. Um, the magnitude of the problem that was reported there um, was 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 daft. We would probably all be dead if that was the case, and the North Atlantic had become that barren that quickly. Um, you know, it, but it is a concern, and it certainly woke me up that morning and, and got the phones ringing. So very quickly, this sort of the 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 expert group across UK and Ireland. Um, discussed, got all of the, the, the best opinion, evaluated the science behind it, um, more importantly, evaluated the, the really thorough and quality controlled science that goes on in the monitoring. This was part of an independent um, um, bit of science that had gone on. But across the UK, then all of the relevant government labs, as well as um, the, the academic experts had sort of reviewed the knowledge, you know, as well as the data and just said, you know, no, I mean, it's 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 silly. But there is a real problem with plankton. So it's not to deride that headline or the motive and the, the science behind it. Um, the last um, probably three or four years, the UK have been developing what we call a plankton indicator, something that will help us actually understand how things are changing, because there's thousands of species of plankton out there and they vary in time and space so it's really difficult to compare um, some plankton from out in the atlantic to ones that are here in belfast harbour because they're completely different communities they're different habitats but the teams have been developing these indicators that allow them now with quite a degree of comfort confidence it's really sort of quite interesting to be able to say we can take this indicator at maybe an inshore location we can take this data that's collected out on a, a ship that goes routinely across the atlantic and is collecting um collecting plankton as it goes back and forth across the atlantic um you could do a podcast on this on its own it's a fantastic citizen science project called called the continuous plankton recorder uh, it's the biggest citizen science project in the world i sound like i'm i'm a salesman for them now but but i mean it's a global project that uses vessels of opportunity towing a plankton recorder uh, it's been doing it for 60 or 70 years now of continuous plankton measurements and it's scary as well as impressive what they're now starting to tease out from that and that there is regional scale changes um to our plankton you know and this is this is you hear the stories about um sorry they're not stories you know you hear the headlines about the, the, the is there a reduction in um, um insects you know out there um using these the car window sort of analogy we don't get them squashed on the cars and this is a real it's, you know, it's, it is doomsday, as you said, that term doom scrolling. You know, are we in trouble here with a lack of pollinators on land? Equally in the marine, um, if our plankton, which are our bottom of the food chain plants, 
and our zooplankton, which I'll, I'll draw that parallel to, you know, insects. These are the sort of the next trophic level up. If that's changing, um, we've got to be a bit worried. So, you know, maybe the headline isn't such a bad thing. It can be, it can be argued, it's right, it's wrong, it's only a little bit right. But the message there, uh, sadly, there's something in it, yeah. You pro- I don't want to put the words in your mouth, but I'm guessing that you similar like I do don't subscribe to you know uh, having like these alarmist headlines where it's no no truth behind it. But then there is always an argument that that actually you know uh, makes people more aware and 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 maybe digging deeper into into like well well do we have another problem on top of that. Um, Listen, uh, that was a really interesting conversation and I learned a lot. Our listeners surely learn a lot as well. Tell me like how like people who listen to that and, and they're thinking to themselves like, wow, I really like to know more. I like, really like to dig into the, this. Um, you mentioned that uh, the papers are being uh, published and I'm sure there's a whole um, library of papers already published. Um, what would be the the best way for people interested in in this in this sort of uh, science and in the outcomes of uh, Compass specifically? How to identify those papers? Is there like a one place with a library of those, or is it like a research gate, or like how how to you know how to get more information and more detailed, geeky, scientific proper info? Yeah, yeah. Um, do you know what? It's it's one of those things we hear terms like fact checking and things like that coming in. And um, um, a lot of the papers, you know, they will be geeky, they'll be really focused and really constrained. And you know, you need, perhaps to take them in context of, of, of broader, broader pictures. So it's a really important question. Um, it's something we've identified whether it's in working groups or as projects like Compass, is that communicating um, and transferring that knowledge and um, the messages is, is not something we do the best because we all put our little scientific blinkers on. And if we have a, um, a paper published, um, you probably give yourself a pat on the back if you know a few dozen people have read and cited it and things like this. It's really niche, you know, and um, it's not something that's 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 necessarily out there. So, do you know what? Sitting here and chatting with you is it's a first step for me in terms of of communicating and trying to actually say the stuff here. Sometimes it's really nerdy, and I'll not lie. There's there's papers that I've been involved with that maybe aren't the most exciting read even to myself um, or to other fellow nerds but then there's stuff there that when you get the context of it it is you know it's wow so if you really want to get into the detail you know ResearchGate is a great place to start you know all papers you can search by keywords and citations um, sometimes they could be so dry that you lose interest and that's a real risk with the, the bare scientific literature, you know, so looking for review papers on ResearchGate, you know, can be a much more a broader and softer introduction, but again, even they can be really dry and a bit niche. So it's, it's a difficult one to measure, you know, for getting people engaged because the scientific community is um, is all about getting accurate and conf- information that you're confident in out there. And then when that information is challenged, you know, I've had it even in the last couple of months, I hypothesized that something would be causing something. Um, and it turned out, you know, it was a rubbish hypothesis and we disproved it. And you sit there going, mm. but actually, you know, we've got to celebrate that and go, yeah, do you know what? I wasn't right there. The data doesn't support that. You know, so this is what we do understand from it. And we're so obsessed, if you like, on some fronts with that clarity. We don't always get the message out there. So um, programs like we've had um, in recent years, you know, Blue Planet and things like this have been just invaluable to opening people's eyes to stuff that's going on. You know, if you're worried about um, um, environmental impacts and learning a bit more great starting places with some of the non-government organizations, you know, the um, the advocacy and lobbying groups. Now, again, 
bit like science, a bit like everything. You have to take it in context and, and, and with a pinch of salt. They'll have an agenda that they want to push, be it marine conservation or um, anti-whaling or whatever it is, and they'll be very focused. But they're a great place to start because you'll meet um, like-minded people. You'll meet passionate people and people who will challenge the status quo um, and to do that more and more they want to use science you know science that's that's objective it's not prejudiced and it's then taken into those policy or advocacy advocacy scenarios um, so those are a great place to start as well because a lot of those organizations will cite scientific literature i mean i'm, I'm noting here you know i'm drinking away from a bottle it's surface against sewage um you know Brilliant advocacy group. Um, I'm sure, like everything, it has its pros and its cons, but um, there's a lot of work and science behind there about water contamination that they've been shouting about for decades. Um, and I think, you know, this year and last year, again, is headline news, you know, about um, our water quality around the coast. So they're great places to get information um, and to start to learn and a great gateway then to start to narrow down into relevant scientific literature um you know they've done some of the filtering for you so um yeah i'd always i'd always um recommend that there's you know wildlife trusts um bird trusts there's you know marine conservation society all of these things they're great great groups and they all serve a really good purpose good ad that's a good advice and 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 also subscribe to tommy Seldor's podcast because we're going to be pumping more of those uh episodes about uh science and scientific uh, research Adam, um, one last question that I always ask uh, my guests, especially scientists, how do you see this whole, you know, climate and biodiversity situation unfolding for the next 20, 30, 50 years? Do you think we're, you know, we manage to steer uh, clear of that, of that iceberg? in air quotes or we just you know it's just a matter of when not if are you Crikey. optimist or are you pessimist in short um i'm reaching here for my coffee um it's not the antidepressants you'll be you'll be glad to hear but my coffee um <laughs> am i a pessimist i think i think most people who know me would say yeah i'm the right grumpy pessimist you know you're always worried about that worst case scenario and trying to prepare for that worst case scenario um i think if i was a true pessimist i'd be digging my bunker i'd be stockpiling food and you know all the rest of it you know but there's got to be hope otherwise i'd try and retrain as a um a merchant banker and make all the money i could and stockpile and look after my own and so on and so on that's maybe unfair. There's plenty of good ethical merchant bankers out there and things like this, but you know what I mean? It's the principle of it. Um, so am I optimistic? I don't think I'd go as far as saying I'm optimistic. I'm really concerned, you know, genuinely concerned because um, we look at the policy landscape. We're designating all of these areas as marine protected areas, or we have targets for emissions on climate and so on. Um, and I'll be honest, a lot of it, unless society backs it up, it's a smokescreen. You know, we say we've set targets. We've elected a politician who said this many marine protected areas, you know, this many, this target of that, blah, blah, blah. And we absolve ourselves of our personal responsibility to the environment. Um, I'm as guilty as the next person here. I could probably look around me and see, you know, things that are made of plastic or gadgets I don't need or, you know, everything that consumerism sort of foists upon us and we, we, we adopt. Um, it's all very well. We need those targets and we need those management objectives in there. But if we separate ourselves from those policies and actually a personal commitment to picking litter up from a beach, um, having a real rant at your water company for, for, you know, pouring stuff into the seas. 
you know, actually engaging um, with with these NGOs or with people who are doing things badly or doing one little thing to to improve it. If we take ourselves away from that, do you know what we really are? We're we're doomed. It has to be about everybody, myself included, um, upping their game in terms of their individual and personal responsibility to the environment. You know, where um, things could be a lot worse. But it's because there are people out there that care that we are where we are. But unless we really push that message, then, um, then yeah, we, we'll need to worry. Adam, thank you very much for that. I really appreciate your time and spend with us today and uh, um, talking about science. That's right. Look, sorry. I hope I didn't end up on um, you know sort of a really negative. Um, no, no, negative that's okay. Part. That that's that's okay. You know that I think that's going to leave our listeners and viewers with something to think about. Yeah, and but that's always get, the purpose. Always get in touch, you know, with whether it's advocates like yourself, you know, Tommy Outdoors, who who have that network of people, or if it's getting in touch with individual scientists or organisations. Um, you know, sometimes you get questions asked that are, you know, a wee bit out there, a wee bit batty, but we're always um, we're always really keen to communicate. You know, the people who work in the sector are are passionate you know about their individual disciplines so um yeah it's it's great if people are interested that's the first part, part of the sort of the battle thank you thanks tommy